Chapter 6 Spear Glass Back in the crow's nest, nestled beneath the stars, trying to imagine winged creatures above me, creatures who never needed to land, who'd never felt earth beneath their feet. Sitting under that glass dome, looking up at the sky's bigger black dome, always put me in a talkative frame of mind. Of course, it was all talking to myself. Before starting my watch, I'd gone down to the navigation room, and Mr. Grantham had patiently let me gawk at his charts. Our projected route was a dotted line, with a few little zigzag markings where we'd deviated because of wind and weather. I looked for the coordinates Kate's grandfather had written in his journal. There was no island marked on Grantham's charts, not even a little dot. I could imagine Kate's look when I told her that. Her nostrils would narrow a bit, her chin would lift, and she'd say something like, Surely, Mr. Cruz, you're not suggesting that every drop of the ocean has been charted. And she'd be right, of course. What is it you're looking for, lad? Grantham had asked in his friendly way. What's over here? Much? Don't think so. We try to stay out of that region, actually. Why is that? Winds are capricious all through there. That's why it's called the Sisyphus Triangle. There's been airships that went in and never came out. I've heard rumors about garbled distress calls, compass needles spinning madly, instruments all screwy. Luckily, there's not much need to use those airways. They don't lead anywhere of particular interest. I looked at the dotted line of our course and made a quick calculation. Tomorrow at breakfast, we'd be as close to the invisible island as we were likely to get. At dinner, I'd left a note in Kate's napkin, telling her what I'd learned. Baz caught me folding it up. He didn't say anything, just gave me a look, like a cat that had taken an entire boogie in its mouth and was sitting very still, hoping no one would notice. Then he winked and walked off. I blushed. And almost blushed again, now, in the crow's nest, as I remembered it. I liked talking to her, but sometimes I'd feel her eyes on me, and I'd be painfully aware of the way my words sounded, or of my body hanging around me like a big floppy suit of clothing, and I wouldn't know how to stand properly, and what was my arm doing there, and was there a bit of spit on my upper lip? I wondered if she was awake, sitting up already at her stateroom windows, camera ready, waiting for first light. Midnight was long past. The passengers were all asleep, and only the crew and the aurora were awake, working and moving through the sky. At night, when the sky is scalloped with clouds and the moon does a vanishing act, you fall back on instinct when looking for moving objects, almost like looking for shadows on shadow. I was gazing off our port stern when I felt one of those little shifts in the sky. From the corner of my eye, some of the stars seemed to disappear. I looked back, and of course, there was nothing. But it spooked me some. My imagination was all riled up from Kate's story and her grandpa's journal. Then more stars were suddenly snuffed out, and a long slash of darkness tilted across the sky. I blinked. At first, it was impossible to tell how big it was or how close, and I was squinting, face pressed so close against the glass dome, I was starting to fog it up. The moon slid out from behind the clouds, and I fell back in surprise as an enormous pair of dark wings soared over me. I swirled around, nearly braining myself against the glass, but the moon was blotted out once again, and all I had to see by were a few listless stars. Something had landed on the aurora. In shadow, it hunched there, not fifty feet from my observation post. Its enormous wings were half-folded back like some fearsome gargoyle. An eye flashed as its head turned slightly. It took a step toward me. I lost my wits, I'll admit, and my mind flooded with nightmare thoughts. I should call the bridge. I should call Kate. I should get down that ladder faster than a fireman on a pole. It was one thing to think about mysterious creatures, another to have one a few feet away. It took another step. The moon came back, and the creature's white, feathered body gleamed 
in the light. Right away I noticed its beak, a long hooked thing. It had webbed feet. It was nothing more than an albatross. It's folding its wings against its body and took a few more steps toward my post. I was mightily relieved I hadn't called the bridge. I could imagine my half-throttled voice reporting a giant seagull. The jokes would become legendary. Young Matt Cruz gave himself a bit of a fright when a seagull flew by. I heard it was a budgie, but you know how much bigger things look at night. Perhaps we should have allowed him to take his teddy bear on his watch with him. I looked at the albatross. An impressive thing it was, the sheer size of its feathered body made me realize right then how easily it would be to mistake these birds for something more, for mysterious winged mammals, for flying cats even. It made me sad. I'm not sure if the albatross even saw me beneath the dome watching it. It hunkered down atop the aurora. With its wings folded, it didn't look nearly so huge. In fact, it was hard to imagine where all that wing came from when they were folded up. I didn't want to scare it, but... I didn't want it on the ship, putting a nick in our skin with those pointy feet. I rapped sharply on the glass. The bird's neck straightened a bit, and its head turned a smidgen. I rapped again. This time the bird just lowered its head into its body, settling down for a nice snooze, happy to let someone else do the flying for a while. I was sure he must be tuckered out this far over the ocean. Look at him, comfy as he could be. His feathers didn't even look ruffled, even though there was a stiff wind blowing on him. Come on, clear off, I said, waving my arms and hands. The bird looked at me, unimpressed. Being ignored by a bird, even as grand a one as an albatross, is rather hard on the self-esteem. I had to get it off, but carefully. No one liked the idea of maltreating an albatross. Before sailors took to the air, there'd been an abundance of stories about the bad luck that would befall any who harmed an albatross. The very long poem of the venerable mariner was one of them. The lads in that one, they shot an albatross, cooked it up for dinner, and had no end of bad luck. I took the speaking tube. Crow's nest. Yes, Cruz? It was First Officer Redu on duty. Lucky me. Sir, there's an albatross landed atop the ship. I've tried to scare him off, but he's going nowhere. He's near the crow's nest. A permission to open the latch and shoo him off? Very well. Take all precautions, please, and report back when you're finished. Very good, sir. I put my goggles on and carefully unlatched the hatch. I clipped a safety line to my belt and tipped the dome hatch up and back. The wind met my face at 80 miles an hour. I turned my head slightly so I could breathe. The simple movement of the hatch made the albatross stand up in surprise, and when he saw my head and shoulders rise up out of the crow's nest, he shuffled back a bit. Go on, clear off, mate, I shouted. The wind hurled my words back over my shoulder. I doubt the bird could hear me, so I waved my arms around my head. This was one stubborn bird. I knew I'd have to let him see who was the boss. Standing up, the bird was no midget. His head came to my waist, and I didn't fancy getting snapped at with that beak. I stepped over the rim and onto the aurora's broad back. The wind met me full on. There was a guideline along the ship's spine, and I took it with one hand, crouching, keeping my head low so the wind shot over my neck and shoulders rather than catching me full in the chest. I took a few steps toward the bird. It took a few steps back. Wings arched threateningly. I had to admire his nerve. Was he planning to walk me all the way along the ship to the bow and see who could fly better? I wasn't afraid of falling. Heights didn't mean a thing to me. Never had. But I did start to wonder if this bird and I were in for a long game of follow the leader. This wouldn't do. In the end, I made my meanest face and lunged at him. Those amazing eight-foot wings swelled open, and the albatross lifted off the aurora. I watched him for a moment. He banked sharply to the east, and as he turned, he unblocked a view of something else in the night. An airship, still distant, but headed right for us. 
I stared for a moment to make sure. Then, hunched over, I ran back to the crow's nest and jumped in, pulling the latch closed after me. I yanked the speaking tube to my mouth. Crow's nest, I panted. Are we bird free, Mr. Cruz? Sir, there's a ship headed toward us. The airship was small, and I could now see why I'd not picked her out earlier. Her skin was painted black, and she carried no running beacons anywhere on her. No light emanated from the control car, either. Her side bore no markings, no name or number. It was only her dark sheen from the moon's light that made her visible at all. She's at ten o'clock and sailing straight for us, half a mile. Bear away, I heard the first officer tell his rudder man. Elevator up, six degrees. Summon the captain. That meant we were going into a climb. The aurora was responsive as a falcon. Stars streamed to my left as the ship began her turn, angling heavenward. I swiveled in my chair so I could watch the smaller vessel. As we turned and climbed, she turned and climbed with us, keeping herself on a collision course. This was no mistake. She was chasing us. She was smaller and faster than the Aurora, and I could feel the vibration of our engines at full capacity. We would not be able to outrun her. Where is she, Mr. Cruz? She's changed course, but still coming right at us, closing at 8 o'clock. Race her on the radio, I heard the first officer shouting out to the wireless officer. She's not responding. A collision seemed sure now, but for what purpose? Distance, Cruz. Some 200 yards, sir. Send out a distress call, I heard Mr. Radu instruct the wireless operator. We're too far out, Mr. Bayard replied. It was clear there was no shaking her, this sleek black raptor shadowing us through the night sky. She's angling up, sir, I said into the speaking tube, as though she means to overshoot us. Take us down, Mr. Hedehoff, take us down five degrees with haste. I felt the aurora pivot and her bow dip. My ears popped and heaviness rose through me. I swirled in my seat peering up and almost over the ship's stern now as the airship pulled closer, altering course as seamlessly as if she'd anticipated our moves. Fifty yards off our stern, I shouted into the speaking tube. Forty. Thirty. She's pulling up over our tail. And so she was, this predatory airship, skimming over our tail fins and gradually overtaking us, only a few dozen feet overhead. She's directly overhead now, sir, matching us. We were leveling out now, and so was the other airship. Less than half our size, she was like some agile black shark hounding a whale. Hard about, please. It was the captain's voice I heard now through the speaking tube, and I felt a surge of confidence to know he was on the bridge. He would see us through this. Again, the aurora swiveled, trying to throw off her predator, but once more the smaller ship matched our movements, slinking over top of us like a shadow. A spotlight flared from its underside, and I saw ropes springing from open bay doors and unfurling toward the aurora. She's dropping lines on us! I shouted into the speaking tube. Pirates. That was all they could be. They're trying to board. Dive and roll to starboard, please. The lines were weighted, for they hit the ship and didn't slide off. I saw six men already dropping toward me. But then the aurora banked sharply, dipped, and the lines slewed off the aurora's back, leaving the men dangling in midair. Ha! You'll not have us! I shouted, shaking my fist. But the pirate airship was already adjusting its course, keeping pace, and as it forced us closer to the waves, we would have less space to maneuver. There was a great flash from the pirate ship's underbelly, and a thunderous volley of cannon fire scorched the night sky across our bow. A voice carried by Bullhorn shuddered the air. Put your nose to the wind and cut speed! There was no need for me to repeat this into the speaking tube. I knew they had heard it in the control car. There was a moment of silence, and I could imagine them all down there, standing very straight and still, the elevator man and rudder man watching the captain, awaiting his command. He had no choice. That cannon could sink us in an instant. Level off and put her into the wind, please, said Captain Walken. Throttle back the engines to one quarter. Thank you. 
The pirate ship glided over us. Once more the boarding lines hit the Aurora's back and down slid six men, clothed in black, with more already on the way. The first set touched down and made faster lines to mooring cleats. Spotlights swept the ship, giving the pirates light. We were connected now, the Aurora and this diabolical little ship. She had us like a harpooned whale, and there was nothing we could do to throw her off. At 400 feet over the waves, we cruised along in tandem. They're on us, sir, I said into the speaking tube. Six of them, and six more are coming. Maybe more, I can't tell. Half were heading toward the aft hatch, the other half toward mine, single file, hunched over, hands barely grasping the guide wire. They were quick. In the spotlight's glare, the man in the lead was a terrible sight to behold. His hair tied back, his face hollowed out by shadow, eyes narrowed against the wind. He must have seen me, for he gave a most unpleasant smile that made my stomach roll over. I caught the dull sheen of metal in his belt, a pry bar, and beside it, a pistol. Mr. Cruz, came the captain's voice. Did you hear me? Lock the hatch and leave your post, please. Assemble in the keel catwalk outside the passenger quarters. Yes, Captain. It felt cowardly to abandon my post, but my heart was clattering and the urge to fly beat in every muscle of my body. The men would be here soon. I locked the hatch, though I knew it would only slow them for a moment. My last glimpse was of yet more men sliding down the boarding lines and landing on the Aurora's back. I started down the ladder as quickly as I could. From below came the slow whoop of the alarm klaxon. Overhead, I heard the hatch being wrenched, then a crack. Heavy footfalls rang through the ladder. I took my feet off the rungs and slid with both hands the rest of the way. I hit the axial catwalk running. We're boarded! I gasped to two of the sailmakers. They're coming through the fore and aft hatches! How many? Too many. They've got guns. The ship's alarm filled my head. I saw one of the sailmakers look at the long wrench in his fist. He grimaced. We were no match for armed men. And then the pirates were all around us. You, all of you, don't move. Let the wrench go, hands where we can see them. That's the way. More and more pirates sprang down onto the axial catwalk, their pistols cocked. Dressed in black trousers and shirts, the pirates brought with them a malodorous breeze of gunpowder and oil and sweat, as though they'd just burst out through the gates of Hades. Their belts swung with tools and knives and gunny sacks. They rounded up whatever crew were unfortunate enough to be up here and forced us down the ladders with them, wedged in by pirates above and below, so there was no chance of escape. Where would we escape to? All along the keel catwalk, the pirates surged, corralling more of the crew and marching us forward at gunpoint, our hands in the air. At the end of the catwalk, Captain Vulcan stood with his first officers before the locked door to the passenger quarters. Across his chest, he would held the ship's rifle. Last time I'd seen it, it was nestled behind glass in the captain's cabin. There were no other arms aboard. The pirates came to an abrupt halt, and for a hopeful moment I wondered if they were cowed by the sight of the captain and Mr. Torbay and Mr. Redou and Mr. Levy and the ship's rifle at the ready. The pirates looked back down the catwalk to the nearest companion ladder. Tall, gleaming black boots stepped nimbly down the rungs. Dark riding pants and coat followed. The man jumped to the catwalk, and the pirates parted, shoving me and the other crew to one side as he passed, walking toward the captain. He looked as if he could have just dismounted a horse at a nobleman's manor. He was smiling as though about to be reacquainted with an old friend. I recognized him at once, for I had seen his likeness sketched in newspapers the world over. He was a handsome man with a high, intelligent forehead, tightly curled hair, large eyes, and pale skin. His name was Vikram Spearglass, and he was as much legend as man. No one in my acquaintance had actually encountered him, but everyone knew someone who had. The stories were many, and all terrible. He sailed over the globe, 
He had no fixed home, and he had never been caught. He boarded freighters and passenger ships and looted them, killing if he needed to. Sir, said Captain Valken, and I marveled that his voice betrayed not even a tremor. This is the most scandalous, a breach of aeronautical law I've ever encountered. Explain this behavior. It needs no explanation, surely, said Spearglass to the chuckles of his pirate crew. We've boarded your ship. We mean to pillage it, and then we will depart. You will not enter the passenger quarters. Sadly, we must. We want to get at all the jewels and pretty trinkets your rich passengers carry aboard. The captain raised his rifle. Sir, said Spearglass, please, let us not play act. Firing that gun would wound your ship. My men are fine aim, sir, finer than you. And once we all start firing, there would be too many holes in her belly to stay afloat. She's a fine ship, and we have no wish to harm her or anyone aboard. You have my word. He was a suave gentleman, to be sure. To hear him speak, you'd think he was the ambassador of Angleterre. We'll also be wanting access to the cargo holds, to have a look about. His men were everywhere now. Dozens of them ranged along the catwalk, crouched atop ballast tanks and ladders and then in the rigging, all with their pistols drawn and pointed at the crew and our captain. Cowardly it was, to come aboard an unarmed passenger vessel with such might and hold her crew at gunpoint. It was almost more than I could bear to watch the captain. He had no easy decision to make. Truly, he had no choice. What he did not give to these pirates, they would take by violent force. You will allow my crew to assemble the passengers in the lounges, Captain Walken said severely. We will instruct them to leave their valuables in their rooms. They will not be harassed in any way. Agreed, said Spearglass. As long as they all behave and don't try to ferret away some of their favorite baubles in their silk pajamas, we have a deal, my good captain. Ah, and one last thing, of course. No heroics from your men, if you please. No daring counterattacks or attempts to send distress signals. Very well, said the captain. He lowered his rifle, and one of the pirates stepped forward and snatched it from his hands. Captain Walken turned and unlocked the door to the passenger quarters, and the pirates pressed forward, driving us with them. At the base of the grand staircase, the captain summoned the other stewards. I caught Baz's eye as he stared, bewildered, at the sight of all the pirates fanning out through the entrance lobby. You will escort these gentlemen through the ship, the captain told the cabin crew. Please take pains to reassure the passengers. The pirates shadowed us as we dispersed through A and B decks. I was coupled with a tall, rangy fellow with only one hand, but it looked big enough to strangle a rhino with. Right now, it was closed around a pistol, his meaty fingers making it look like a child's toy. A gunny sack was tucked into his belt. We will be collecting bracelets, timepieces, necklaces, brooches, rings. Spearglass sang as we proceeded up the grand staircase to the A-deck. In particular, we are fond of anything with precious stones and gold and silver. Though rest assured, we will not be asking for gold fillings tonight. His crew erupted into raucous laughter, as though this were all the best of fun. I would also like the keys to the ship safe, if you don't mind, Captain, said Spearglass. It was unpleasant work, rapping on people's doors at four in the morning and telling them that the ship had been boarded by pirates. They were requested to please throw on a robe and come to the lounge while their rooms were pillaged. I'm sorry, I told a frail lady and her sister. No harm will come to you. They only want things. But we're very fond of our things, said one of the ladies wistfully. Don't be daft, Edith. They'll work them to whatever they want. In went Rhino Hand, rummaging through their steamer trunks and bureaus and stealing whatever they wanted. I left him to his work and proceeded down the corridor. By this time, with the alarm and noise, many were already awake, opening their doors and sticking out their heads. I reached the end of the corridor, at the Tokapi stateroom. 
I'd barely raised my knuckles to rap when the door opened. It was Miss Simpkins. Her hair was tied up in rags, and she wore a scarf round her head, so she gave me a bit of a shock. Without her makeup, she looked quite different, puffier, and her eyes seemed smaller. "'You must come, miss,' I said. "'Pirates have boarded the ship.' "'Pirates?' she said in outrage, as though we'd somehow planned this just for her inconvenience. "'You and Miss DeVry must come to the lounge now.' "'We'll do no such thing, young boy. Now shoot! I'm about to lock my door.' A great boot hit the door, bursting it open, and nearly smashing Miss Simpkins, who gave a squeal as Rhino Hand strode into the room. "'You heard the young lad,' the pirate told her. I hadn't known he was capable of speech, but he had a very fine British accent, as it turned out. "'To the lounge, please, ladies. Sorry for the inconvenience. Lashings of apologies.' By this time, Kate had appeared in her nightdress. "'What does this mean?' she whispered to me, pale face, her eyes huge. "'Don't worry,' I said. "'We've been boarded, but they've promised to do no harm as long as we cooperate.' She hesitated, looking stricken, as the pirate poked about her camera, deciding whether to take it or not. He didn't, in the end, seemingly more interested in the wardrobe drawers where there were plenty of sparkly things to put in his sack." Come along, I said, and led them to the lounge, where most of the other passengers were now assembled, sitting stiffly in the wicker chairs, looking like wax dummies under the electric lights. All these people whom I normally saw in dinner jackets and evening dresses, laughing and eating, were now in their pajamas and bathrobes, small and bewildered. A few people tried to talk, but silence waited the room like thunderclouds. Watchful guards stood at the main entrances. Spearglass himself was perched on the bar, helping himself to a drink. I can guarantee you're all insured, ladies and gentlemen, and this will be, at worst, an inconvenience. We mustn't get too attached to our worldly possessions, after all, must we? What are they but things, bubbles, trifles, bits of stuff? He thumped his heart. It is here we must find our treasures and store them up, and these things know no price. A real comedian he was. This was as much a vaudeville performance as a robbery. But if newspaper reports were to be believed, his sense of humor could shrivel up in a second, from a laugh to a gunshot without any warning. The pirates were efficient, I'll give them that. It seemed hardly any time at all had passed before they were back with bulging gunny sacks and pig smiles. Then another pirate entered the lounge, a great bearded mountain of a fellow, pushing the chief wireless officer, Mr. Featherstone, ahead of him at gunpoint. "'What's this, Mr. Crumlin?' Spearglass asked. "'Caught him down in the wireless room trying to send an SOS,' Crumlin said. "'Uh,' Spearglass said, as though confronted with a particularly stubborn child. "'Sir, I thought we had something of a gentleman's agreement,' he said, turning to Captain Walken. "'You would let us go about our work unmolested, and we would leave you and all aboard unharmed. But trying to radio for help? This is breaking the rules, wouldn't you agree?' "'He knew nothing of it,' Mr. Featherstone said. "'I was acting on my own. Sorry, Captain.' "'Very noble of you,' said Spearglass. I commend you for your honesty, but this does distress me, it truly does. I'd been quite enjoying myself until now. Everyone in the lounge was rigid and listening, and Spearglass addressed us all, as if we were an audience and he was on stage. You must understand, all I have in the world is my good name. People know me. They know that I might come aboard their ships and take their goodies. They know that I am a pirate. To be an effective pirate, one must be respected and feared. So what would become of me if people started to think they could put one over on old Spearglass? Try to trick me. Try to catch me. No, that wouldn't do at all. I must protect my good name at all costs. He drew his pistol and shot Featherstone point-blank in the head. A great gasp from all of us sucked the air out of the room as the wireless officer fell to the floor. People were crying and screaming. Doc Halliday was at Featherstone's side in a second. He's dead, he said. Listen to me, Spearglass shouted. 
I will not be trifled with. I do not relish killing, but I will do it if I must. If you do not show me the proper respect, you force me to earn it. I bid you all farewell. He turned and left the lounge, and his men went with him. We all stood frozen for a moment. My insides were ice. I don't think anyone really knew what we ought to be doing. Some part of me thought we should be following them, seeing what they were about, making sure they did no mischief to the ship. But no one seemed keen to anger Spearglass further. Captain Walken nodded at Mr. Torbay and Mr. Wexler, and they cautiously began to follow the departing pirates. I wasn't supposed to, but I went too, falling in step behind the officers as they headed down the grand staircase and through the access doorway to the keel catwalk. Overhead, I could see the pirates climbing the companion ladders toward the axial catwalk. I wanted to make sure they kept going. I wanted them off the ship without harming her. I can follow them, I said to Mr. Torbay. They won't see me. You'll do no such thing, Mr. Cruz. They won't even know I'm there, sir, I persisted. Mr. Torbay had seen me swing over the ocean on a piece of rope. He knew I could climb and hide myself amid the ship's rigging. You do not have my permission, Mr. Cruz, he said kindly. Do not follow us. Is that clear? Yes, sir. They started up the companion ladder to the axial catwalk. I would not follow them. I would go aft and climb up through the rigging, unseen by officers or pirates. It was unlike me to disobey an order, but there was something going through me. A terrible fear that the ship might be in danger. My home. And I could not just sit in the passenger lounge, blind, hoping everything would be all right. I raced aft and scampered up the wiring and braces. I could swing my way around the ship like a spider. Up I went, hidden toward the axial catwalk, my feet springing from wire to wire. Almost level with the catwalk now, I could see the pirates waiting their turn at the next ladder, climbing up to the forward observation hatch. It seemed they really were leaving, without any other evil design on the ship or her passengers, and I felt my heart begin to calm. Maybe it was truly over. As the last pirate began his climb, I ran down the catwalk and hurried up the ladder to the aft crow's nest, past the shimmering gossamer skin of the gas cells. I peered out through the domed hatch. The remaining pirates were crouched along the Aurora's back, grabbing at boarding lines, uncleating them, and then holding tight as they were hauled back to their airship. We would be free before long. Four more lines needed casting off, and then we'd no longer be tethered to that infernal little pirate ship. Just then, I looked beyond Spearglass's ship, and I saw a great dense mass of darkness against the night sky, and I knew just by the Aurora's vibrations, that we were headed into a storm front. Rain started clattering against the ship's skin, and the Aurora bobbed sharply as the wind hit it. Above me, Spearglass's ship gave a mighty downward lurch before steadying herself. The last of the pirates cast off their spider lines and, pelted by rain, were reeled in, swinging madly in the gathering gale. We were free of the pirate ship, but not the elements. The front was rolling over us now. I was not afraid the Aurora would founder, but the pirate ship. Plowing through a front, you sometimes get a microburst, an intense downward column of wind that can drive you suddenly lower. I snatched up the speaking tube. Crow's Nest reporting! Mr. Cruz, came the captain's voice. What the devil are you doing up there? Sir, the pirate ship has cast off, but we're heading into a storm front. I'm aware of that, Mr. Cruz. Now get down from there. Sir, the other ship, she's awfully close. At that moment, the wind took the Aurora in her grip and gave us a mighty downward shove. I heard our engines roar to full throttle, felt the elevator struggling to keep us level. From above, I saw Spearglass's ship, a fraction of our size, come hurtling down toward us, driven by the same wind. She's coming down on us! I felt the Aurora start to dive and roll, but we were too late. The pirate ship veered into us, tried to pull away, but another gust of wind pushed us together again. I saw and heard Spearglass's propellers come toward us, two great whirling blades on her starboard side, slashing the night, and then the Aurora. 
the propellers caught in our skin and kept cutting through the taut fabric, through the gas cells inside. The propellers slashed through our port side from stern to amidships. I felt the horrible chainsaw vibration rattle the entire ship. We're breached! I hollered into the speaking tube. The pirate ship slewed away from us and came back once more, its propellers rushing right toward me. I dropped down the ladder and was nearly thrown off the rungs when the blades cut through the hull. Then they were gone, wrenched back into the sky. I clung to the ladder, panting, listening to the roar of the propellers fade. And then there was a new sound. The mango-scented gush of escaping hydrium.